Pray with me again. God, we thank you for your words to us today. We pray that through what I've prepared, what we have heard, and what you are saying to us in our hearts, that we would hear you and be able to draw closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to talk today about something, I think I might be a little bit loud, maybe. Just a little bit. <laughs> Don't want to scare anybody. Um, I want to talk today about something that, um, it, it, it's really been on my heart uh, f for a long time because I, I, I know a lot of Christians. I've met a lot of Christians all over the world, and for the most part, I find the same, the same what do I want to say, problem. Many people call themselves Christian, and they, they live a Christian life, and they, they try to do Christian things, and they go to Christian churches, and they read Christian books, and they listen to Christian radio, and they buy Christian cards for holidays, and we do all these Christian things. But a lot of them don't really know the life of Christ. A lot of them really don't, haven't experienced except for in rare occasions, haven't really experienced a presence of God that, that's tangible. It, it's something that, that seems elusive to us. It's something that seems like we have to work really hard to get to a place where we can, where we can feel that and know that. And, and, and so many, many of us Christians are, we're, we're, we're working kind of hard, I guess. We're, we're trying to do the things that we think we're supposed to do as Christians, but we're not really finding the res kind of results that we see in the New Testament. We're not, not really seeing the life of Christ in ourselves and in our relationships with other people. And so Christianity for us is kind of something that we sort of plow through because we think we're supposed to, and then when we die, we get to go to heaven, and everything will get sorted out. Everything will be, be great then. But the New Testament seems clear that this idea of heaven, this idea of eternal life is not something that hap starts after we die. It's something that begins the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. So it seems like there's something wrong here. It seems like something isn't right. Something's not working. There, there's a lot of things that Jesus has called us to that, that we don't do either. It's still true today, what, 50 years after John, Ma Martin Luther King Jr. said it, that Sunday morning is the most segregated morning, uh, is the most segregated time in the whole week in the United States. It's the time where the white people go to the white church and the black people go to the black church and the Asian people go to the Asian church. Why is that? <laughs> Jesus, uh, Paul tells us that Jesus died to bring down the veil. The, the church should be the most diverse place, not the least diverse place. And, and in churches, where do you find politics that are more difficult than in the workplace and even in the government? In churches. So where is the life of Christ? Where is it? What, 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 what are we missing? What, what are we not doing right? And we read today's passage. It says, if you love me, keep my commands. So we think, well, yeah, I, I'm supposed to love Jesus because, you know, after all, he died for me. So I better follow his commands. But, but is, that, is that really love? I think that's the key. I think that's where we are missing it. Let's talk about why, why we obey. There's a, there's usually, there may be other reasons, but there's usually a, four reasons why people would obey Jesus Christ. The first one is because we want to get something. And the main thing we want to get is we want to get into heaven when we die. When we die, we want to not go anywhere else. We want to go to heaven. And so we obey because we think that's the way to get into heaven. And you see this in all of our uh, movies in the United States, this idea of good versus evil. And if you're a good person, you do the right things, you obey the r rules that everybody thinks you're supposed to obey, then you're going to get into heaven. I think of the, it w this was very, very clearly portrayed in the movie Ghost. The, the, the murderer, all these black things come up out of the ground and pull him down to hell. And then, you know, the good people get to go to heaven. There's this white, black, this, and, and that's, 
That's how a lot of us have been taught about Christianity, about what Jesus uh, has brought to us, and, and that we need to obey, and that, that's how we show our love. And, that, and we can get blessings, we can get um, into heaven when we die. Another reason why we obey is because it, it's kind of related, but because we're afraid, because we have fear. I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't obey. I'm afraid of being punished. I'm afraid of going to hell. I'm afraid of God punishing me somehow, even in this lifetime. And that's why we obey. Because I, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> I don't want to get caught by God and, and, and be punished. And I can't tell you how many people I've met who get cancer or something in later life and they believe that they're being punished for some sin earlier in their life. I think you've heard the story of the woman who, um, she was a, a very, very avid churchgoer all of her life. She raised her children in the church. She uh, always gave 10% of everything she had um, to the church. She served on uh, boards. She taught Sunday school. Uh, she cooked for the church. She, did, she, she was dedicated to the church her whole life, tried to live a good life. So she's on her deathbed. She has cancer. And, she, and her uh, family keeps going in there, and, and they, they can't understand her attitude because she's saying, I know God's punishing me for something. I just can't think of what it is. Because, you know, I've lived my life. I live my life right. I, I live my life as God wanted me to. And then uh, one time her, her, um, one of her daughters called the minister in um, because she said, I figured it out. I finally know why I have cancer. Uh, and I, I've told you this story once before, but um, there was a time in her life when her husband passed away. She had four small kids. Uh, she didn't have very much money, and so she didn't give her tithe one, one week, one week, because she needed the money to feed her kids. And, and then on her deathbed, she's saying, I know. That's why God's punishing me because I didn't give my tithe. So th this is the kind of thing we get caught up in when we're obeying because of fear. We get caught up into this plus minus economy thing where we believe that God punishes for doing the wrong, doing wrong directly, or we believe that he rewards for doing right. So we're trying to get and we're, trying uh, we're afraid of being punished. Then there's just obligation. And uh, you meet people like this too. It's not really so they can get something per se, and it's not really because they're afraid. It's just, it's just the right thing to do. I just kind of impose rules on myself. Um, and it could be because, you know, I want to get something. But the, it's really focused on, on, on the rules, and you have to get all of your ducks in a row. You have to... And you, you, you get almost addicted to, to knowing what the rules are and following the rules. And the Pharisees are good examples of this, right? Or the fourth reason why we obey is out of love. Now, it may seem a little bit strange, but you can think of relationships, can't you, where there's a deep love between the two people and they want to do what the other person asks of them, right? Right? When, when your children really know that they are loved by you, they're more likely to do what you ask them to do if they can sense that deep love that you have for them. It's their, it's their love in response. And this is what Jesus is talking about in chapter 14. Now, we may think that, you know, you can have more than one of these, that you can have uh, love and fear, and that's why you obey. And, and I've had a lot of people tell me that that's, you know, that, those, that we have to have a little fear or a little um, de desire to get into heaven or a little bit of obligation in, in order to move towards this love that Jesus is calling us to. And at some point, we almost get to the point where you think that the, the uh, obliging ourselves to obey is how we create love in our hearts for God. But when ha has that ever worked for you? Have you ever made yourself do what somebody else is asking you? Did that make you feel love for the other person? I'm not really sure it works that way. Can you love and have this desire to get? I, I don't think so. I think 
It's not love if you're doing it to get something. And we do this even in our relationships, in our marriage relationships, in our family relationships. Love, for the most part, is, is something we receive. It's something we're, ge we're getting from the other person. We're ha we feel happy, we feel we're, we're in love when we're receiving. It's not necessarily about us giving. And this is why the love and getting don't really work that well together. Can you love and fear? This is something I have a lot of arguments for, with a lot of people about. Because um, the Bible does talk a lot about fearing God is the beginning of wisdom and those, these kinds of things. But um, if you want to have a conversation about that with me afterwards, I'm happy to have that conversation. But the New Testament seems very clear that fear and love don't mix. They can't work together. If you have fear, you can't have love. You can't love something that you're afraid of. First John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So you can't have love and fear. And how about love and obligation? Well, I, I know I've heard uh, marriage counselors who say, I know you feel like you don't love your wife, but just for a month, do what you would do if you did love her for a month. And oftentimes this fixes the marriage. Um, because just the act of th thinking what I would do if I did love my wife, by doing those things, the, the love is kind of rekindled, regenerated. So I suppose you could, you could argue that it is possible that if we oblige ourselves to, to obeying, that we will create the love in our hearts. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's, uh, that's a, a useful way to live our entire lives. There might be times where that could be helpful for us, but I don't think in the long run putting obligations on ourselves is going to bring us into a close, loving relationship with God. In fact, uh, there are places in our New Testament where it says that it, it's got to be just love. For example, 1 Corinthians 13, the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. We, we can do all the good things in the world, but if it's not coming from love, it means nothing. You say, well, it has to mean something. No, it means nothing. If it's not coming from love, it's worthless. It's the love that leads to obeying, not obeying that leads to love. I was taught that obeying leads to love. That I learned this thing from the Baptists. They said, ruts of routine become grooves of grace. It's a cute little saying, right? So you, you put yourself in these ruts of routine and you, you oblige yourself to do the right things and eventually it will become, uh, uh, God will give you grace and everything will be happy and you'll live happily ever after. I, I, I haven't personally found that to work very well, but some people at least pretend that it works for them. But our job is not to obey. Our job is to learn how loved we are so that we can love in return. And then the obedience becomes unnecessary. Because out of love, we are doing what the Father has called us to do, has put in us to do. That's really how the New Testament tells us this is supposed to work. It's not by us finding the rules and doing what we're supposed to do. It's by us understanding that we absolutely are loved. And that love draws us into living as if we were loved. The other part of this is when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, uh, obey what I have commanded you. Obey what? If you just read the Gospel of John, you don't get a lot of um, brush your teeth two times a day, and uh, you, don't, you don't get a lot of 
very specific rules. You don't even get rules like you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery. You don't get rules like that in the Gospel of John. What you get are things like the work of God is this. Believe in the one he has sent. In chapter 7, you get anyone who is thirsty, come to me for a drink. That's, that's a command. If you're thirsty, come to me to drink. In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about his sheep hear his voice. These are the kinds of things that Jesus is thinking we are going to obey out of love for him. That we listen to the shepherd. In John chapter 13, he uses the word command and he says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, the whole world will know that you are my disciples. In other words, the whole world will know that you are loved and that you are living in that love. They will see the love. They will see the life of Christ in you. How many places have you ever gone where Christians gather where you can see, yes, these people love each other, even in their meetings, even as they serve each other and help each other? This is the life that Jesus died to give us. It's, it's there available to us. But the, the, road to, the road into that is not obliging ourselves to rules. The, ro the road into that is to understand, to know that we are loved and to live in that love. John chapter 14, you trust in God, trust also in me. That sounds like a command. John chapter 14, later on, I am preparing a place in the Father for you so that where I am, you can also be. He is in the Father, and that's where he wants to take us, into the Father, so that the Father is in him, we are in him, he is in us. We're one in this love, in this life. So as we get later in the passage we read today, Jesus says, you will see me. And that's the title of my sermon today. So this word see is not really physical see, but see in the sense of understand, see in the sense of, of, of uh, experience, see in the sense of know. Jesus' promise is that he will be with us. He promises that he will be in us, and that he will show us the Father, that we will know how loved we are. That if we live in that love, we are fulfilling everything that God desires of us everything that God made us to be, and everything that Jesus Christ died on the cross to make possible. We will see him, not on the outside anymore, but on, on know him on the inside. We can learn to let go of everything because that love has created such a trust with the Father that there's nothing we need to hold on to other than the fact that we are loved. When you read the Gospels, what does the Father say? The father only has two lines in the, whole th in the whole gospel story. And they're the same. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The father says that when Jesus is baptized. And the father says that when Jesus is transformed on the top of the mountain with three disciples. The father says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That is the power, that love of the Father is the power that allowed Jesus to be obedient even unto death on the cross. He let go of everything. He lived in, as if he really was loved. He understood that he was loved and he trusted in that love and went all the way to the cross for us. Love takes you to places that commandments can never ever take us. What Jesus did was not because he was obeying written commandments. It was because he was obeying the Father who loved him directly. Many of you, many of us, will continue to live our counterfeit faith. We will continue to pretend that we're Christian and really not experience the life, the love that Jesus died to give us. We'll continue to follow rules because we're afraid or because we want to get into heaven or just because we believe it's the right thing to do because that's all we've ever known. That's the way we've lived. But read through the New Testament, especially the Gospels. 
and you see a different life there. You see something that Jesus came to give us that's so much more than that. All of the religions basically say you need to do these things. You need to do these things to, to, be, to be right, to be good, to, be, to get into heaven or to get enlightenment or whatever. Jesus offered us something different. He said, I'm offering you the love of the creator of the universe and living in that love. So it's, it's our choice every day. Are we going to live loved by the Father or are we going to continue following whatever rules we think we need to get or to avoid whatever we think we're trying to get or avoid? The choice is is ours each day, every day. Let's pray. God, we see the life that Jesus had. We see that you loved him and that he loved you completely and lived in that love. That as you loved the son, so he loved the world. God, we want that love. We want to live in that love. So help us. Help us to see that you really do love us and, and draw us step by step into your love so that we might show your love to the world in the way we live the life that you have given us. In Jesus' name, giving you thanks, we pray. Amen.